Personality. The poor little underpowered GameCube, hardly a match for the might of the all-conquering PlayStation 2, with Sony's machine hitting harder, faster, and in every way stronger than Nintendo's machine could ever hope to... Ah, uh, sorry, I got my notes back to front there. Apparently the GameCube was significantly more powerful than the PS2, and so actually, to use the parlance of this video, beat the PS2 most of the time by default. Huh. But history remembers the winners, so it's the PS2 that's gone down in the grand annals of gaming history, with the GameCube overlooked and often forgotten. So I thought I'd look at a bunch of times where Nintendo's machine did actually one-up the PS2 because... Well, because I've not done one of these videos in a while. Deal with it. Some house rules, first party games aren't in the mix. Games exclusive to the GameCube aren't in the mix. If that were the case, it'd just be a list of Nintendo games and Rogue Squadron, and that's not really a comparison. This is games that were released on both formats, usually one a port of the other, sometimes a slightly modified version, but for the sake of argument, the same game on the two different formats. Also, something to note, if this was straightforward and looking at better graphics and frame rates as a win condition, we'd be here all day because most games released on both formats ran better on GameCube. Thing is though, I'm not Digital Foundry, so in the most part I don't care about that. For the most part. Oh, okay, let's just get some of those over with first. The PS2 released in the distant future, the year 2000. The GameCube hit 18 months later, that's a long time in tech. So it's no surprise Nintendo's little purple or orange or whatever toaster had fiercer chips inside her. This resulted in things like Rayman 3 Hoodlum Havoc, which ran as smooth as a greased up otter in any tube you could think of on GameCube when, like a box full of forks stuck on a hill on PS2. Spider-Man 2, the movie tie-in misremembered as brilliant, it was actually alright but incredibly boring after not long, was another case of silky and pretty on GameCube, grotty and choppy on PS2. Tomb Raider Legend was another, with the GameCube version showing that Lara Croft's home shouldn't stay solely on Sony formats as the others were doing it a bit better. Dead to Rights had this bit with a stripper and made me feel queasy. Also, the same thing again, smoother and better looking on GameCube. Do we understand why I didn't want to go down this route yet? It's true, the GameCube versions of these games, like Beyond Good and Evil, are better than the PS2 versions, but the differences in general are cosmetic, they don't impact much, and really, they just don't matter. And yes, I know BG&E on PS2 supported Progressive Scan and the GameCube version didn't. That all said, sometimes those very same differences, frame rate mainly, did matter. Need for Speed Underground is riddled with slowdown and, frankly, runs like garbage on PS2. On the GameCube it's a smooth 60 frames per second, and in this case it matters because racing games thrive with a solid quick frame rate. As such, Underground is demonstrably better and more fun on Nintendo's console that had a handle. Ditto Sonic Heroes, which goes from stomach-churning choppiness on PS2 to some half-decent fun on the GameCube, thanks to that buttered-up stoat silky smooth smoothness we've heard so much about already. Even Shadow the Hedgehog manages to be a tiny bit more fun to play on GameCube, which is quite the feat considering it is abject garbage in the most part. But that's enough words on the better frame rates and higher quality textures. On to the rest of the list in which I will continue to say words about better frame rates and higher quality textures. One problem with the PS2's domination in its particular console generation is that it stole a lot of thunder. Never more so than with the Capcom 5, or at least three of the Capcom 5 because only four games came out in total and one of them, Piano 3, remained a GameCube exclusive. Beautiful Joe was the first to jump from GameCube exclusive to PS2 also ran. The original release was one of the most inventive, creative and outright fun brawler platformers we've still ever seen. Honestly, it's a genuine delight and you should search it out wherever you can, but not the PS2 version. Obviously the general themes carried across and those core mechanics were still, to coin a term, bonza, but the generally muddier, less detailed look was compounded by technical hitches and slowdown on the PS2. Did it make it a bad game? No. 
but it made it a compromised vision and that's almost as crappy. When it came to Killer 7, the whole GameCube exclusivity thing didn't even factor in. Goichi Suda's tale of multiple personality assassins, nuclear disarmament, and general weirdness came out day and date on both GameCube and PS2. Even so, it was another one clearly far more suited to its home Nintendo format, with the version carrying Sony's branding on the box looking worse, loading slower, and criminally not offering the same level of responsiveness to its controls as on GameCube. That last one was a bit of a Killer 7 killer for me, with the game being quite bloody hard and requiring the mechanics actually, you know, respond to your inputs. Lastly, the one that annoyed its creator, Shinji Mikami, Resident Evil 4. All of the Capcom 5 weren't meant to come to PS2, but Resi 4 really wasn't meant to make that jump. Nine months after its GameCube launch, that very jump was made, and looking back it was little more than a cash grab. I can understand it, given the GameCube's relative lack of sales next to the PS2, but it was night and day between the original version and the port. The comfy seated cinema viewing of the 70mm version came first, then almost a year later we got the VHS recorded off ITV version, ad breaks included. It's a metaphor, stick with it. Maybe a simile, I forget. Regardless, while the time difference allowed some added extras to be brought to the PS2 port, they were uniformly crap. When you put the two versions side by side, it's not even a competition. Resident Evil 4 shouldn't have released on PS2. It just shouldn't. The Capcom 5 was meant to support the GameCube and Nintendo and show that the format had something to offer beyond the usual array of first-party greats. 60% of them breaking that exclusivity was a knife in the back some of us still haven't forgotten because we have nothing better to do with our time, apparently. A quick and easy one for you here, any four-player game was better on GameCube. Why? Because it had four controller ports as standard, whereas the PS2 needed the extra outlay of picking up a multi-tap. That meant something like Time Splitters 2, aside from those basic graphical and frame rate upgrades to expect on GameCube, was also massively more accessible for multiplayer play. Oh, and 007 Nightfire 2, which I guess I should mention given I did play it and record some of it for this video. By the way, who are you? The name's Bond. James Bond. That's a bad Pierce Brosnan impression. I know what you're thinking, yes, both versions did have monkey targets, so regardless of whether you played Super Monkey Ball on GameCube or in its PS2 incarnation, the Deluxe compilation, you would be able to play the magnificent minigame of launching monkeys in balls across the ocean and trying not to drown them. That's a win for both sides. But when you look at the overall games side by side, a pattern emerges. A jerky, jagged pattern, at least when you look at the PS2 version. A game that actively jars the eyes and engages the motion sickness gland to a high degree. A port that's riddled with the usual slowdown and worse graphics you'd expect, but one that really suffers in comparison to the GameCube original. On its Nintendo home, this is one smooth customer, like a weasel doused in engine oil buying some chips, that plays beautifully and doesn't leave you wanting to vomit your guts up all over your bedsit's floor. Which is, really, preferable. There was an era when Rockstar would publish things and not just dress up 10-year-old cowboy games in a shiny new suit or add yet another new mode to GTA Online. One of those things was Smuggler's Run 2 on PS2, which released in 2001 and was followed by a revamped, retitled version on GameCube in 2002. Both games mix off-road racing with some level of destructiveness, a post-apocalyptic motor storm, sort of like… oh, no way they did that with motor storm, so a, a bit like that one then. Smuggler's Run 2 was a decent, fun game first time around, a solid, early noughties mix of openish worlds and classically arcadish goals. Warzones, the GameCube version, did those graphical, polishy things we all expected, but it also upped the ante in a few ways. Multiplayer was increased to four players, you can thank the aforementioned four controller points as standard thing for that, while in that very multiplayer mode you no longer had to unlock all the vehicles like you did on PS2, meaning it was much quicker to get going with everything. A hover bike was added, which you won't see here because I didn't unlock it, and in general the whole thing just had that intangible feel of a better game on GameCube. Look, I said I'm not Digital Foundry, I don't deal in precise measurements. An overlooked gem in its own right, Metal Arms Gits, as it's 
brilliantly acronymized, was made by Swingin' Ape Studios for its GameCube release, and the Xbox, but we're not talking about that here. But the PS2 version, released on the same day, was actually a port by a studio called Mass Media, with development running simultaneously with that of the original. And, well, you can tell. It is the same game, the same story, the same setup, the same mechanics, but there's a markedly different feel to the PS2 game when compared to the GameCube. Controls feel less snappy on the Sony version, and you're actually left a mite afloat at times when it comes to elements like needing to time jumps properly. I would describe it in my professional experienced way as floaty-like. The PS2 version also sounded worse than the GameCube version, with muffled and quiet audio muddying the atmosphere, while those other two obvious hits, a lower frame rate and generally poorer looks, cropped up too. Oh, and the four-player thing with the GameCube multiplayer supporting more people than the PS2. So yeah, more differences than you might think, even if the result on both formats is still a game worth playing, and a genuine hidden great. Well, not great. A hidden good. So the differences between these two aren't huge. Basically, the GameCube version had some animation and AI updates the PS2 version didn't see, resulting in a smoother overall look to things and opponents who were more challenging thanks to the fact they'd actually do things like shoot from outside the area. Additionally, the physical makeup of the GameCube's controller, the octagonal analog stick hole, say that five times fast, meant it was actually better for fine control on the Nintendo pad. None of it was a giant difference, though. What made it special was that this was the only time a winning 11 game, or Pro Evo in Europe, released on the GameCube, and hilariously it outdid the series' traditional home platform of PlayStation, making itself something of a cult classic in the world of footy games. It's still bloody good fun, too. The 800,000th attempt at a Dragon Ball Z game, Budokai was... alright, I guess? It let you play through the main anime slash manga story, which is always good, and ugh, I'm just filling space here. It was the same game on GameCube, except for a cool cel-shaded look. That's it. Another EA game on a list about a Nintendo console's victories over other formats sounds like it goes against common sense, but it's true. Fight Night Round 2 on GameCube wiped the floor with the PS2 version, and it wasn't anything to do with those looks and frame rates I said I wouldn't talk about before going on to talk about them loads. See, Fight Night Round 2 on PlayStation was a boxing game on a Sony machine, and it was good, and that's about it. Fight Night Round 2 on GameCube was a boxing game on a Nintendo machine, and as such, and thanks to a Nintendo initiative, it brought in a Nintendo boxing game character, Little Mac, as a bonus. He looked incredibly weird and gave me nightmares. But the GameCube version of Fight Night Round 2 also included the Nintendo boxing game, Super Punch-Out, in its entirety. So not only did you have a really good, fun and pretty boxing game with a bonus character looking like the type who would hide in a wardrobe and watch you get changed, it included one of the SNES's best ever games as a random freebie, there to play from the get-go. Lovely stuff. We all remember this as being the wonderful exclusive character era. The Xbox got Spawn, nobody cared. The PS2 got Heihachi, which would have been the best, except for the fact that the GameCube got Link. Link in Soul Calibur 2 is brilliant. He fits perfectly, he makes sense, he has plenty of identifiable characteristics and manoeuvres, and even his music gets wadged in there too. Heihachi was cool, no doubt, but cool wasn't good enough to beat the GameCube, because the GameCube had Link, and Link was perfect. And there's a list! Be furious in the comments, correct my pronunciation of snares, tell me I've forgotten games I haven't forgotten, and don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and make me a millionaire so I can afford the Battlestar Galactica board game expansions. I appreciate your time. Bye!